the Never Gets Old podcast, the podcast of all we love in TV, movies, music, and comics, with your hosts, Mac Jackson and Nick Nero. Look for us on YouTube and Facebook. Everybody and welcome to the Mr. Control Podcast. I'm Nick McCarroll. And I'm Mac Jackson. And today we got a whole slew of things to talk about, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. We'll skip around. Um, to start with, we just want to give a nice uh, shout out to Fandom Lenses. Uh, it's a blog done by Sarah Clark who we mentioned on the previous podcast, but was nice enough to... Uh, do a nice review of what you're listening to now. Yeah. Well, not this one, because this one is just being done right now, but <laughs> previous ones. Yeah, uh, it's funny, too, because I agree with all that she said. Um, she mentioned how she's typically not a fan of podcasts, and up until recently, I didn't even know they existed. Yeah. You know, before we got going on this, um, you know, I, pfft, it sounded like a, a techno, nerdy thing that I, you know, it could have been talking about gigawatts for all I know. Well, uh, <laughs> but now that I've gotten into it, I, I really appreciate it. It's, you know, I, I hope we're accomplishing what we set out to. And according to her, we seem to be because she said we're probably the most laid back podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are. I don't know. We're, we're pretty laid back. I don't. It helps to be laid back when uh, you don't have a real goal going into it, maybe. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. And well, I don't feel I don't feel like under the gun to to say anything or do anything. Oh, I I do have something I I do want to say though. Um, it's it's not so much a, a retraction as an explanation, but um, for everybody who are, are you still there, Matt? Oh yeah, I'm here. Okay, just making sure. Um, for everybody who does listen, um, there were it was a couple episodes ago we were discussing nerdy stuff. I believe. I mean, that's that's so vague. Um, I was talking about uh, Twilight fans and and people who only um, like one aspect of nerdy stuff and hate all the rest. Or, or, or oh yeah, I remember stuff. that. So the people I um, and I I kind of specifically said uh, you know girls, which uh, at the time I, I just threw it out there because those were, I mean when you put Twilight, well sure, it's, it's kind of just a girl thing, um, but I didn't mean it to come off so uh, misogynistic, I suppose. Um, it really goes for everybody, but I mean, I don't know a whole lot of guy Twilight fans, so yeah, and that's how I, I took it too. To just pick on to pick on girls, and uh, it's funny because I think later on in the episode we also talked about how um, you should say what you mean and not dance around it, and uh, I don't want to come off as a hypocrite either because I I didn't mean what I said, but there's a whole bigger issue than than uh than just twilight girls and who who paint that okay but everything else sucks um <laughs> it just i was i was rambling so <laughs> no but you know what i'll say in your defense too um i didn't take it that way uh you, i think it's because you mentioned twilight like you said that you're you followed up with girls because you're right twilight has been typically as far as i have seen or heard for the girls right right typically and yeah. then, but I, I think uh you know that it was only because uh i think i gave it that connotation because i specifically know some people in my life who have been like all the stuff you like is stupid and i love twilight <laughs> like 
they didn't seem to understand the connection and they happened to also be girls um so i was mad at them specifically not in an overall overarching sense um but also i mean it really goes for anything like they're the sports nerds, you know, the, the, the guys who, like, pour over statistics and stuff like that. Like, I'm sorry, that's nerdy, too. Right. So, <laughs> just because it's it's real dudes playing a real game doesn't make your, your fandom any less nerdy. Um, it's just a different kind, you know. So, but anyway, that's all I wanted to get out of the way. I Why, did you, did you get some case. flack? What's that? Did you get some flack for that or from somebody or what? I, I would hate to have uh, alienated um, a portion of the audience just because I said something like that. So I didn't um, just by listening back. Your your yeah, it's, it's, yourself. I listened to it myself. It caught me, and I was like, "Oh man, wow!" <laughs> I, I I caught myself in like a an angry mood right there, and it was like I said, it was really just a super specific group of people that I knew who like. They just didn't see the connection, and and they happened to be women. So I didn't want to like, I didn't want to, I don't know. Gotcha. People think I hate girls because I don't hate girls. the woman haters club. <laughs> that, we we belong to the woman haters club or something. Yeah, the the uh, what is it, man, what is heat that? and woman haters club. Oh uh, well, yeah, the the little little rascals, uh, rascals, right? But I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking uh, Married with Children. Oh, okay. I don't know if you ever watched that show. It's probably a little too crass for you. But... No, no, no. I remember when it was It was right when Fox was starting, too. That was Fox's first big hit was Married with Children. Yeah, my grandfather used to watch it all the time. And I subsequently, as a child far too young to even understand what was going on in the show, watched it with him. All I know is he laughed a lot. Sure. <laughs> it's like, I guess it was like the... Uh, the modern day um, Archie Bunker, but without the racism, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. But um, yeah, for those, I mean, just to to explain a little more, uh, it was nice what Sarah said was how we're laid back, and you could tell like it's unscripted. Um, one, uh, some of the podcasts that I listen to, as much as I love them, like Comic Vine and uh, boy, the Nerdist and and uh, Crawl Spider Man Crawl Space. I love them, but they also keep themselves very um, regimented. They, they want to only spend a certain amount of time on a certain topic, and then they want to move on and hit all the bullet points. Whereas with Nick and I, we are uh, we're friends that met at the comic book store. And when Nick mentioned about possibly doing a podcast, I thought it was perfect. Because even if we see each other at the comic book store, we we'll go, all right, shut up, shut up, stop talking about whatever. We'll talk about it on the podcast. Right. So what you get to hear as you're listening to us chat about random stuff is we're comparing notes for the first time. We haven't had these conversations before. And I think that's one of the, the wonderful aspects of what we're doing. I mean, yeah. it's, it's great for us. And, you know, hopefully it, it seems to be anyway great for the listener. Yeah. Oh, I mean, there there are times where we, I mean, and we say it too, or at least I do. Um, you know, we we've talked about this before a little bit, but I mean, we really we uh, ever since Mac, you know, gave up on comic books, we uh, I haven't seen each other in person as much. But I didn't so, give up on comic books. I was I know. well, I never see you there. I, and I mean, but that's just because like, oh, different times. times. What's that? We go at different times. I was there earlier today than I normally would be. Oh, yeah. See, I was there at like 10.30, 11, maybe. Okay, I was there around 1.30, maybe. Oh, uh, okay. So, but yeah. <laughs> I didn't give up on comic books. <laughs> no, but you weren't you weren't buying for a while. Right. Well, I had to play catch-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. So, yeah. I'm, I'm doing good. okay. Uh, so, you got up, oh. right? You know, I'm a little bit behind, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing much better now. <laughs> no, it was it was just it was just a floodgate of I want I want I gotta read this I gotta get it, and you yeah. get that habit of all right I have to get my books on Wednesday. If I wait even a day late, I feel it. It's like a weird kind of uh, 
threw my game off. So Thursday rolls around. If I don't have new books, I start twitching. And I swear to God, I, I, I feel it. So I would go, okay, I got to get my new books. I got to get, ooh, there's a new title. Ooh, that looks good. Yeah. To As a credit to the comic industry, um, the last 10, 15 years have been the highlight of the run. I mean, the writing is so mature and intelligent and not dumbed down. And so you want to read so much stuff. Yeah. I'm reading the big two, Marvel, DC, but I'm also getting into like much more of the independent stuff. You know, and then they hit you with the miniseries that you're like, oh god, all right, it's five issues. I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna get it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so then I got overloaded. I thought, all right, I'm two weeks behind. Oh, look at now I'm a month behind. But meanwhile, I'm still reading, but there's just so much and it doesn't stop. It's like the no. postal service. You go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to stop myself until I caught up. Which anytime I started to beat myself up with having to wait. I'd say, nope, shut up and go up and read a book. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm happy to say I'm an issue or two behind on every title, but... Yeah, it's not quite as bad. No, well, what hap- what helps is if when I'm not going to the store, I'm able to get them on my, I- my new iPad, which I adore, because now I never have to box or board a comic again, unless, you know... Like the MacGyver miniseries, I'm getting the actual comic. Okay. You know, to have. Yeah. For stuff that you really, really like, that helps. Yeah, uh, and I got the... I had, I had, I, I might I would probably do that for, for... You what? If I had an iPad, I would probably do certain titles on that. Things that, like, maybe like miniseries or annuals or something like that, and then... That would probably clear up a lot of space for me. Um, but then I just get like the, the core titles, you know, in in regular form because I like to have them um, in the physical form. But I only, I mean, I only have an iPhone and it's small, and uh, I don't really want to read on there unless I have to. So, <laughs> um, right. And I'm not in a rush to get an iPad, so that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Plus, I like. I mean, sure, the the uh, getting them on the iPad is is easier. Um, you know, it, it's right there. You can, it's crisp. It's whatever. But I, I, I like going to the comic shop for the atmosphere. Yep. And I don't know if everybody's experience is the same way, but when I walk into Comics on the Green, like you never feel like um, alienated there like the, the the vibe is always cool even if like no matter what time of day it is even, even if i don't say anything to anybody when i go in you know like just say hi to dave or whatever like i'm i don't feel bad in any way you know like um i uh dave is a good friendly not only businessman but he's a good person so he, you know, he's, he's a pleasure a, to interact with it's a cool atmosphere like it doesn't matter if i I just came from work, you know, like, covered in, in dirt or soaking wet or whatever, or if I, you know, dressed really nice for whatever reason, like, it's the same sort of treatment, and he, he, and, I mean, there are people that go in there that are, you know, more than the, the atypical kind of comic nerd, and, uh, they still get the same kind of respect, you know, so it's just such a cool place, and I, I like that, you know, it's, um, not, it doesn't feel like an exclusive club that you should be afraid to go to. Right. Well, uh, remember, remember what I was saying about like uh, going to the concert and how, or the Stargate convention. If you're lucky, you are interacting with people who should. And I think this should be true about anything, but in this case, we'll say the comic book store. You should be treated like family. Hopefully, you know what I mean. Like you're all in the same boat. Let's. If there's a if there's a, a opportunity to be kinder to another person, yeah, take it. And with certain with music or with comics or with anything like that, I think that that opens that door for that possibility. Yeah, which is why it really sucks if you come across an a hole who's you know gonna give you a slack and be like the comic book guy on The Simpsons. And, Worst issue ever, you know, that type of thing. 
<laughs> um, yeah, I, and it's just, it, it's funny because um, that's something uh, I, I wish a lot more people could learn. And, and, and uh, you know, it's not, I don't want to, I don't want to judge people too harsh because, um, like, a lot of people are really shy in, in social situations, and, and I think that sure. tends to come off as them being negative, and I only say that because for a long time when I was younger, um, I was I was very, very shy, and a lot of people thought I was just mean. I remember my friends, like, in high school telling me, like, oh, when we first knew you, you know, because I, I had moved from, from one uh, school district to the next, like, all these kids grew up together and knew each other, and I didn't know anybody, so I was just really, really shy. I was young, you know. Sure. This, I didn't know how to deal with it, and uh, you know, it wasn't until much later when you, you could be more open with people that they're like, we thought you were like a jerk, because you never talked, and it's like, I wanted to, I was just too shy to like, I don't know, I didn't know how to just deal with that situation when I was little, you know, like, who knows? Yeah, so, yeah. I, I, I still think there are people who like, until you kind of get them to open up, they're, they're, you, you won't, you don't really know, but I mean, once you do, you kind of can figure out if they're a jerk or not. So yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I'll it's a situation, and you're, uh, you know, right, a complete jerk, then that's that's one thing. But well, one of the things that I I've, I've personally witnessed, and it, it, you know, from the outside, it's kind of well amusing. You you watch certain people who, like you said, if you're uncomfortable, you're shy, and you don't know how to interact with somebody, try putting them in front of. A quote-unquote celebrity, yeah, it be someone in a band or you know uh, an actor, going to the Stargate conventions and various concerts, uh, hanging around with these people. You can watch the people who overcompensate in their mind for I don't quite know what to say, but I want to make an impression, <laughs> and they come off yeah. as obnoxious or you know they're trying to be funny, but they come off as a jerk. Yeah, yeah. And I've I've learned to just feel bad for them, but and at the same time I praise whoever the celebrity uh, is that is has to deal with them, mm -hmm. because by all means they'd be well within their right to go you know tell them off or or whatever it is they decide to do, but I've always witnessed amazing restraint and super kindness. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at least it, it, from what I've personally seen, and it makes me just admire the heck out of them. Yeah, well, that's probably because we don't live in Hollywood, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a different animal out there, I think. Right, right. Well, <laughs> I mean, a lot of the Stargate people are up and, you know, came from Vancouver, and uh, to watch, like, say you're in line to, to get something signed or a picture or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I've watched people in front of me get a little too, oh, I'm trying to be chummy with you, and we're going to be best friends, even though we have, oh, five seconds together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just think, ooh, let's first remember that they're people, and, you know, and I, that's the way I always conduct myself, and it's, yeah, yeah. it's paid off, not only for my own benefit of, of becoming friends with, with uh, various people from that uh, realm, but also just for my own... Um, if I look back on myself, I don't ever want to go back and go, oh, man, you blew it when you met whoever. Yeah. You know, like, oh, God, I shouldn't have said that. That would kill me. That would just completely wreck me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, sometimes, not that I've met a whole lot of celebrities. I've only met, like, one or two in my entire life so far. Um, but, it, I mean, I, can, I guess I can understand where, you know... Uh, it, when you when you love something, whatever it happens to be, like whether it be sports or movies or comics or whatever, like it, it's probably really difficult to divorce the person you, you think you know, which is really the character mm -hmm. uh, or the persona, whether they be like you know a public figure or whatever, from the idea that that person is more or less just like you but right right a lot, whole lot more attention and probably money um but generally like the same 
wants and needs and desires as anybody else, really. Mm-hmm. Which is, I, it, you know, it, it, fame is a funny thing. Like, I, I'm sure, like, the idea of it is really cool, you know, to, so everybody knows you and you think it's just going to be, like, you know, the Beatles, people, women throwing underwear at you and, and men being like, you're the best, you know, whatever. And I'm just saying that from a male point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know how that feels. It's probably way worse for, for girls to be famous because I'm sure it's a mu- well, as we've seen with some of the uh, the Hollywood starlets going nuts. Get I mean, catty. Not just because they decided to go nuts. Right. Uh, but yeah, like it's it's a it's a ridiculous animal, and I think what the the actual desire for fame really is is just the idea of respect. Really, I mean, and recognition for your work. What's that? Recognition for your work as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's it's kind of this like subconscious desire to to, to just be universally loved, you know. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, I think when you, if you kind of can break it down like that, and you, you meet somebody um, that you that you respect, you know, in uh, for for doing something in the entertainment field, um, and you can kick the, the the idea of like freaking out uh, initially, and and then treat them with just the respect that they wanted in the first place, then. You know, you might be way better off um, in your interactions with them. Right. Uh, and, and that... For me, it's paid off. Hope to do. Yeah. And, and it's, I'll tell well, you... Uh, in a little bit, I'll tell you a story of my weekend. And it exactly what we're talking about comes back and is... It proves how impressive another human being can be in that situation. Right. Um, well, go ahead. Can you tell me... Why don't you tell me now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Since we kind of did a huge, long segue right into exactly what you want to talk about, so. Uh, well, if you're twisting my arm. Okay, so Saturday I went to uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania to see the Chapin Family Christmas. And, yeah, uh, and uh, wonderfully enough, I got to see our friend Jen Chapin uh, in person. Which is weird to say, because we've been, um, you know, email buddies for years, and then she's been a guest on our podcast, uh, which everybody please go check out. It's a it's a wonderful uh, conversation. Way too short, even though we did do our hour. Uh, we could tell we were just given the surface on that one, uh, but you know, it was late when we did it. So anyway, yeah, all this time knowing Jen, it's funny to, to think about it, and I, I haven't actually gotten to see her, meet her in person. Uh, I, I said to her, I sent her an email saying, isn't it funny? I look back on Saturday, which is when I got to see them, and it just felt like I was seeing an old friend. It didn't feel like someone I hadn't gotten to meet in person before. And maybe it's it's the trick of the whole Skype thing when we recorded uh, the podcast with her. Yeah. But if I, could I, without getting into all the details of every moment of the night, um, I'll tell you, it was a heck of an affair because not only did they sound fantastic, I was, and this is going back to what we were just saying, uh, so impressed with their kindness and their patience and just i don't know if the the phrase has been coined yet but if it hasn't i'm coining it good people being good to people okay i mean that if, if you're gonna explain the chapins that's what i would say um i got it's funny because a couple of them i i've gotten to see before during the summer i got to see steve chapin uh, who his band is actually Harry Chapin's band. Uh, Big John, uh, who fans of Harry Chapin would definitely know from the big booming voice uh, and Mr. Tanner and the really high voice in Taxi. Um, and Howie Fields, who's going to be on an episode 
of our podcast. Uh, actually, when I got there, I saw him. I went over and said hi. He goes, oh, hey. And he, he said to me, whenever you want to do the podcast, just let me know. So he remembered. That's cool. Which is very sweet. Very uh, uh, yeah. And I'll tell you, too, it, what was nice about hanging out was that, you know, if you go to, say, a typical concert, you're, if you're lucky enough to get anywhere near the, the act, uh, there's people standing there and they want to make sure you're not getting too close, and blah, 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 and, you know, you're being rushed through. Mm-hmm. The Chapins aren't like that. Um, the whole family is very kind, very open, very, uh, you know, Tom was there who I hadn't gotten to meet before. Um, so I got to talk to him and I had to hold back on what your natural thing to say is, you know, oh, I, I love Harry and, and, and his, you know, all his music and the person he was. And, but at the same time, this whole family has heard all their life and will for the rest of their life hear about one, how great Harry was. Right. Uh, two, how much he and his music have, have affected them. I know that because he did it for me. But I also know he's that type of a person. Very inspirational. I Anybody who, who wants to find out more, just look for clips. Listen to his music, but go also watch any video clip of him. Uh, the most unpretentious person in the world. Anyway, so talking to Tom, and I just touched on it lightly and said, you know, same as everybody else is saying. However, I am also a singer-songwriter, and either consciously or subconsciously, I tend to write some story songs, and I've been blessed enough to have people say that it reminds them of his stuff. And if you're going to be complimented and have your work be like one of your heroes, you know, yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh-huh. Uh, and we got a couple pictures, which is really sweet. But I'm watching him... And I watched Jen. Oh, first of all, let me jump back. When I first saw Jen, runs over. We, we, we come at each other with our arms open. Big hug. It, it just, it was sweet. It didn't feel, you know what I mean? Like it's yeah, old yeah. friends seeing each other. And then thinking about it afterwards. Like, wow, we never have actually seen each other in person until then. Right. Um, but then, you know, to step back and watch her and Tom. Uh, Abigail Chapin, who I met during the summer uh, was there with both her sisters. Her one sister um, had actually stepped back from performing. Uh, There used to be three of them. Well, she stepped back once she had her daughter. She was there. And so you got three-part harmony on all their songs. And just to watch them all interact with people, go through the crowd, uh... You know, not looking to avoid eye contact, actually making eye contact, smiling, and approaching people. Uh, getting all the pictures that people wanted with them, listening to all the stories about Harry. Uh, yeah, and I, like I said, I had the luxury of stepping off to the side because, again, one, I'm in no hurry. You know, two, I have an in, so I'm not, like, going to be pushed out the door. Uh, three, and I figure I can always shoot the bull with them after the show. So, I, it was just, it was very impressive. At one point, I'm walking with Abigail, and somebody runs up to her and says, you know what you should do in your act? I'm like, oh, God. Hmm. You know, yeah, I, I kind of cringed because, really, you're going to tell someone who's been doing this her whole life, you know what you should do? Yeah. You know, but I'll tell you, I guess the point of the whole story is just to watch her not blow this person off, listen to what she's saying, respond with kindness, you know, and, and didn't make anybody feel like they weren't being heard. I, I just very, very impressed with the whole family. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it was great because afterwards uh, got to hang out and shoot the bull. Uh, it was nice, though, when it's nice to have people that you've seen before and not go, uh, I think I know you. Like I see Big John, and I'm like, hey, remember I saw you in the summer? He's like, oh, in the forest, in that in that location where it was out in the middle of the woods. Mm-hmm. That, that's good memory, and it was a great location. But yeah, and uh, 
you know, big hugs from Abigail, and, and we were talking about music afterwards. Uh, <laughs> end of the night, everybody's packing up. Pretty much everybody's gone. Um, it's like 11, I think, at night, and, and we're still talking. And she and her sister are going to put out uh, an album of them singing Everly Brothers songs. Because I said, what kind of, you know, what kind of other songs do you, other kind of music do you like? And she comes off with that. Well, she hit the jackpot there. I said I named my daughter Everly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, everybody else had left. And then she just had to get her guitar. And, you know, she finally, uh, I guess the management, <laughs> given, given the eye signal of, okay, we'd all like to go home. You know, can you guys wrap it up? <laughs> but yeah, I'm telling you, they had, uh, besides them, who else was? Big John's son was playing bass. Uh, Steve's son was playing guitar, shooting the bull with him for a while, talking shop uh, about playing and, you know, being busy and having so many irons in the fire. Uh, but you could tell, I mean, the family is just blessed with talent. Even the, li even the little kids, uh uh the the chapin sister jessica uh her daughter mj was there what a cute little girl i mean she's three and she's already got the personality she's she's up on stage and you know they they sang a bunch of harry songs a uh, couple tom songs uh the chapin sisters sang this great song which i'm gonna play over while we're talking about it now called let me go okay it's one that I told her when I first heard her sing it during the summer. It was stuck in my head for like two, three weeks. Uh, um, she's got a great, powerful voice that she has a lot of control over. Um, but yeah, they're all up on stage. And at the end, they sing Circle, which is kind of like the Chapin family anthem that uh, Harry would always do at the end of his concerts. Okay. Well... She's up there, and all the kids, they bring their kids up. Jen brings both of her kids up. And uh, <laughs> little little MJ's waving to everybody. You know, there's no shyness. There's no, oh, I don't want people looking at me. She's talking to me, telling me, I'm three. Next, I'm going to be four. Like, you know, I, oh. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, hey, I think going to be four, right? <laughs> Or yet, just, uh, Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. Yep, he turned four Tuesday. Oh, this past Tuesday. Four. Past four. Yeah. Past he was four. Four. What? I, did, I was gonna say he was born on Christmas. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Two weeks before. That was nice. Um. Nah, he'd still make out all right. But oh, it's always arranged marriage. Yeah. <laughs> but um the whole uh, just it it felt wonderful to spend time with people and just feel like you were hanging out with people who knew you and liked you yeah you know what i mean like that invisible fence that not to get all philosophical and deep but we all put around ourselves but people who are in the limelight a lot more have to yeah. As well as they should, you have to be careful of who you interact with. I didn't feel that, at least from my point of view, which was wonderful. And I remember leaving there, and Cindy texted me. She said, are you on your home? I said, yeah, now I am. Dot, dot, dot. And I feel liked. She got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I mean bunch of Harry songs, a couple Tom, some Chapin sisters, you know, each person got to do some of their own material, but they also did great versions of Christmas songs. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and, and to say, how often do you hear a song you've heard a thousand times, but now you're going to hear a new version of it and like it? Yeah. Most of the time they're atrocious, and I don't want anybody doing their own, you know, I don't need to hear um, Here Comes Santa Claus again. There's a video that's on the one of the Facebook sites. It's backstage of Tom and Steve 
and it's not it looks like they're they're getting ready to go on and they're rehearsing and they have uh little mj dancing around <laughs> and it's a good uh, i can't think what the heck the song is but it's fantastic the version it's a faster version of a slow song um ah oh, it's gonna drive me nuts anyway uh yeah the the versions that they did i want and one of the things i bought was the chapin family christmas album that was for sale there and that song wasn't on it oh uh, a new one that, oh i hope so well this said it was volume two so i'm trying to think of what it could have been i mean I, I tried to find volume one and sure enough i i couldn't uh, yeah, not yet. Anyway, I'm I'm hoping somebody out there will help me get a hold of it. But uh, so that I mean that was my that that was my experience, and it, and it was fantastic. Like I said, just to to be around good people that weren't standoffish, and that were really inspirational as far as how they deal with people. You know. Yeah, well, that's always a good thing. Oh, yeah. And like I said, it was like an early uh, birthday slash Christmas present for me. My birthday was on the 17th. Yeah. Uh, actually, home Happy birthday again, by the way. Huh? I mean, I know I said it to you on your birthday, but I'll just say it here too as well. It's a couple days later. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, for, the, for the people listening, it's now a few days after his birthday. So. While I'm, uh, while I have you... Uh, or while we're doing this, I found the video just because I I hate leaving it. Uh... Oh, it's not going to work. Of course not. I can always edit this part out, but I'm trying to get the, the video to play. Okay. That's on the Facebook page, and I don't know if it's because we're recording or not. Yeah, it might be. But uh, it's funny, too, because I'm looking at it, but it won't, once you hit play... It doesn't seem like it wants to do it. Well, darn it. Uh, um, no, nope, it's going to drive me nuts. But anyway, Steve sings it, and the Chapin sisters do a great harmony, uh, like a callback to it. You know? And, oh, yeah. God, their harmony was so strong. and The whole family just, just gelled so well together. I, so impressive. Uh... I, anybody who can possibly ca catch any of their shows, either by themselves or with the whole darn family, I highly recommend it. Not just because they're good people, but because it was an outstanding, you know, professional show. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that was my that was my Saturday. I had to drive all by myself because nobody would go with me. Oh, uh, uh, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Uh, I offered it to Nick, he couldn't. I offered it to a couple other people. They wanted to, but they couldn't. Uh, some person was going to and then backed out. And then as I'm driving down there, my mother says, oh, I would have gone with you. Oh. Like, well, uh, you, you know, I, you knew this was coming. You didn't, <laughs> she swears she said something, but I, I don't think so, because I would have remembered it. However, in yeah. hindsight, I said to Cindy, it's a good thing nobody was with me, because I think they would have slowed me down. Yeah, you know what, sometimes when you do things uh, and you do them by yourself, you're like, yeah, I wish I had someone to, to do it with. Because I go on, like, action figure runs and stuff, and I'm like, oh, man, I wish, like, I had someone to talk to. But then, then I'm driving, I, I'm singing in the car, like, I'm practicing, and uh, then I get into a store and I just kind of zip around where exactly where I have to go, leave, do exactly what I want to do, don't have to worry about anybody, and then come home, and I'm like, well, uh, you know what? It's better off, <laughs> you know? Well, it's or, or when I go down to, to Jersey for film and stuff, it's like, oh, I wish... Because that's a much longer drive. Like, it's two and a half hours or so. Yeah. Oh, I wish I had an entourage. <laughs> and then I get there, and I'm with people, and I'm like, you know what? I don't have to babysit anybody. And, and, and uh, I hope when I'm with people, they don't feel like they have to babysit me. Right. I, I hate that feeling where, it, like, I feel like, people feel like... Um, they have to uh, stick with you or take care of you. Like you can't do stuff on your own or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I hope I don't, I don't make anybody feel like that, but um, they try not to. Right. Because I hate that feeling, you know, where like you, uh, 
say maybe you invite somebody somewhere and then like they cling to you, you know, but, um, right. Which is fine. Uh, it's fine. But at the same time, it's, it's a little more restricting than, uh, than I, I generally like. Right. Well, and that was the thing too. I'm thinking about it and you know, it's not, I said that, you know, ah, it probably would have just held me back because it's nice to, like you said, just get up and roam around whenever you want and not have to check in with everybody or yeah. anybody because you do have to be courteous and turn and say, hi, do you want to go with me to over here? And you got to, you know, and, and I just, no, it, other than the ride, the lonely ride there and the lonely ride back. Exactly. Um, other oh, it, was only, did you say it was Bethlehem. Yeah. Bethlehem. So- hour and a half ish depending on right except my gps would take me into bethlehem and then done it wouldn't take me to it was founder's way and and the gps did not recognize that street Uh so i can see the big steel you know i remember jen talking about it the big steel beams that they light up and everything i thought okay i'm just gonna drive towards that yeah and eventually I found it. I was pretty thrilled. I ended up parking in valet parking even though they didn't want me to, but nobody was guarding it, and I needed a place to park. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't trying to be, you know, bold or anything, but the guy the guy said, just go down here, take a left, and I did, and I'm like, oh, parking. And then as I'm walking out, the guy goes, is that valet parking? I'm like, I don't, I look in there, it's, there's a sign that says valet. I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is, but they don't have my keys, so I'm doing okay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I think a lot of the roads just for like two seconds, but uh, a lot of the roads down there are new. I don't know who are anyway. I don't know how old your GPS is. The one that I have is a couple years old. It might be close to like five now. And I was just thinking about it in the past. So whenever I go down the beach, I like, or I try to sometimes like, when I go farther away and uh, I'm, I'm looking for something um, like sometimes when I, I take trips or even wherever they go I'll probably just stop at like a business or whatever park or Walmart if I'm looking for something and just just to see because our area is pretty slow when it comes to new stuff so I'll check it out when I'm when I'm further away or in like a, a bigger city area and uh, put it in the GPS and the the GPS takes me to where it thinks the store is, and then it's no longer there. So I'm in a big nook of nowhere. So uh, that could be hectic sometimes, but yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, how old is your GPS? Like probably the same as you. Um, but here's the problem. I know you have to plug it into the computer and, and get it updated. Yeah. Okay. So Cindy and I said, all right, let's do that. This is right. only maybe a month ago. Uh, uh, or no, might have even been just a couple weeks ago after the Monkees concert. And I look, there's no wire that lets you connect it to the computer. I have to go, <laughs> I have to buy that separately, apparently. Oh, uh, well, guess what, too? I mean, I don't know what uh, what brand of GPS you have. Garmin. A, a, just a, a Garmin? Garmin, yeah. Nuvi 200. Okay. I think that's what we have, too. But the, the map pack for... Um, to update it is like just as much as buying a new GPS. It's like a couple a hundred dollars or more or something like that. Nice. So we'd be better off just buying a new GPS. I think my dad's gonna at some point just buy a new one and then I'll have the the old one that doesn't work as much. But <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, if it gets me in the general area, I'll I'll play Indiana Jones after that and be on an yeah. adventure, you know. Yeah. Um, one of the things. <laughs> Sarah Clark had mentioned was uh, the sound quality, how it's getting better. Thank yeah. you, Sarah. Uh, we're well aware. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's funny, too, because when we're done recording these, we don't always know if we're getting feedback or, or if it's crackling on one of the ends, you know. Uh, but it's, it's nice to have it be appreciated the lengths of which we're going to to make sure the sound comes through. Yeah, I just want to say that I'm uh, I'm very appreciative to everybody who has been listening and uh, will continue to listen because we will do our best to make just how quality just improves uh, for every passing time. And I, I know it was rough in the beginning in, in spots. And uh, unfortunately, 
there's a, a, a heavy portion of uh, our Gen Chapin episode that's really rough to listen to. So if you guys made it through all of that, then then thank you because it's uh, it means a lot, you know, for even not to to put this out there and have have a number of people appreciate it. Um, so that's yeah, my look. We're getting some nice feedback too. Somebody just um, made a nice comment on our YouTube page, which again, everybody, please. We strongly recommend going on there, giving us, you know, ideas if you want us to talk about something in particular, if you have a comment to make, uh, good, bad, indifferent, whatever, we'll take it. Um, but by all means, share this with people because, you know, a lot of people have said to me afterwards, oh, I didn't know you had a podcast and that's what you talk about. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> yeah. So please share it. I, I try and put stuff up on our page all the time, asking people to share it on their page. And then, or, or I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll put it on people's Facebook page and ask them to like the never gets old podcast fan page. And they, they like my comment. I'm like, no, no, not the comment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah I, I wish it translated into liking the actual page, because if you like the page, then whenever we add an update or hopefully say anything of interest, they're made aware of it. But uh, oh, another thing uh, we're, we're, I wanted to remind everybody about was the art contest. We do have someone who uh, said they are going to contribute. Well, that's good. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm pumped. He asked for ideas. I gave him ideas, but again, I, I'll say it for everybody who doesn't know. Any type of art that you would like to do to be featured related to our page. It could be pictures of Nick and I, like your own interpretations. It can be, um, you know, a whole page with us and our, if you go to one, our notes on our Facebook page, we have a list of our individual likes, music, TV, comics, movies. Uh, you could take characters from that, whatever you want. You can do a logo. We. You know, it'd be nice to have an actual official logo. Um, you could do a banner for on top of the page. All, all of this stuff will be shown probably till the end of time on every episode of our podcast. <laughs> because anybody who goes and watches these on YouTube, um, I'm going to see maybe about putting them on iTunes. Nick and I were talking about it. I, I yeah, we'll figure it out. Be okay to put the audio on there. But when I put when I'm piecing this together to be on YouTube, I have to put pictures in. And so I'll show rotating pictures of us, but there's much more interesting stuff. If we talk about a particular topic, I try to put in pictures of that topic. Well, your art will be part of that rotation. Hmm. It's never, you know, make sure you sign it because I like we're going to give everybody credit and, you know, brag about them. But uh, if anybody out there knows of any artists or is an artist, give, give it a shot. It's not like we're going to go, ugh, God. <laughs> hey, Nick, did you see this one? Oh, God, that sucks. Even if you draw us in crayon like a small child. Even if you what? What? What did you say? <laughs> if, 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 we, if they draw us in crayon. Oh, in crayon, yes. Crayon. Yeah. I say crayon <laughs> because crayon... You're missing two letters. Yeah. I don't, it's an English major in me, I guess. Yeah, I'm big on grammar. Cindy's big on spelling. I'm big on grammar. I'm big on both. Yeah. Uh, I think we were talking about that the one time. Yeah. I'm saying it, it hurts. It hurts my my heart. It hurts me on the inside when uh, I see people who are are, are I know are, are smart and more intelligent. And their keyboard skills make them appear when uh, my Facebook uh, feed rolls through or, or even on Twitter or anything like that. It's just, I mean, there are people I expect it from, but still, um, yeah, that's, it's upsetting. It's upsetting to me is the, the point I was making. It hurts me on the inside. It's a little quiet. And these are like, these are people that graduate from college too. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, how? how? How did you possibly make it through? Well, for me, I can't stand when people butcher the word Scranton. There's a T in it. Yeah. And yeah. But, you know, you get these people, they always would say, oh, they're from the island. Uh, 
But it's not just people from there. You get just if people want to be slack jawed and lazy, they'll say Scranton. Yeah. And I can't think of a a, a, a word to make you sound more dumb than that. <laughs> you know, I'd rather if you're gonna butcher a letter in that word, turn the O into an I and say Scranton. Really? You think you think that's the worst from our area? You don't think Hana or No is uh, I don't, the I worst don't really possible? That. <laughs> well, that's the Einan joke they would always make. Him go into the the what was it, like uh, go into the Einan. I'm gonna have a sandwich, maybe a cup of coffee. The Haina family. They used to do that on the radio. Yeah, yeah. And you know, very rarely would I come across somebody who <laughs> would seriously try and talk like that. I have. Well, that, I mean, oh, yeah. I'm sure of my my. I've, I've come across a lot of characters <laughs> and aren't doing it ironically is is the thing that's what uh, tells me yeah oh man it's a it's a weird situation to be in when uh you you work a contractor like you you and your father work together and then oh you yeah because we i forget like people are so for the most part unless they know us really well we're really, really uh, just about contractors and, and, and workers and, and stuff like that. Um, and I forget because we we always do our absolute best and, and uh, our work for itself. Um, but we'll find other people that are in the trade, and it's not not every. You know, not, I'm not trying to make sweeping generalization with a percentage of of people that are exactly the way that they, you know the stereotype of the low lazy contractor doesn't show up and is drunk and you know not intelligent i'm just like oh man no i well the, you know cliches are cliches for a reason yeah you know what i mean you, you granted you don't want to give sweeping generalizations but man they they're out there there are cliches yeah you know and um yeah so that's, I mean, that's the one I hear a lot because people will say, oh, where are you from? Scranton. Oh, you're from Scranton. No, no. Cindy actually sends an email to all the newspaper people when she goes, hi, I'm Joe Schmo reporting from Scranton. She'll go, eh, nope, and then send an email saying, you know, you're kind of <laughs> representing your station. Do you have to sound like you're, you're a mook? Yeah, yeah. You know? And I love that. I love that she does. The, the only time I say it that way, or or anything else, any of our other um, uh, local little words that they use, it, ironically and purpose, when it's when I'm talking to somebody who uh, who does say it that way, yeah. and not purpose, you know, as a joke, but yeah, <laughs> well, language, how far we've come and how much we've destroyed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what? Um... One of the things on my notes here, I'm looking at them. One of the fans of our pod podcast is the wonderful Gail Simone. Oh, yeah. Who I had a quick, um, uh, what, uh, instant message back and forth with just to sh give her some support because for whatever reason, and I don't know what the reason is, I don't, yeah, you know, it ultimately isn't any of our business, but you got to wonder, um, she got pulled from writing Batgirl. Yeah. And I don't get talked, that. Huh? We literally just talked about Batgirl and Gail Simone, how we liked Gail Simone on the last episode. And I think it was the next day. Yeah, and then, yeah, the next day, one of the following days after we had recorded it, we uh, kind of uh, posted it. Uh, yeah, that new broke. That was being a bad because like I said I, I really enjoyed that uh, the entire time I was buying it for the person I was buying it for um, and reading it yeah well that was the thing too because I was reading a lot of her other series before it including the uh, Secret Six right. which, which was fantastic I mean I love Bane and she threw Bane in there um, and it, you know, and I don't like the type of shows where you're supposed to root for the bad guy, like Sopranos or Mad Men, or you know, we talked about that. Like, yeah, like all the shows I feel like. Huh? <laughs> all the shows I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, and this was a book, a comic book about bad guys. 
Yeah. And but yet she pulled it off to where it was intriguing. I wanted to find out what was going to happen next. So they give her with the with the start of the new 52 where they start over basically uh, with all the DC characters. Uh, she's writing Batgirl, which she said was her dream job, and I don't blame her because I love Batgirl too, and I'm thrilled that Barbara is Batgirl again. Right. Um, I can't see anybody else as much as I love Cassandra uh, Kane. Uh, she was a different kind of Batgirl, and I liked her as a character, but Batgirl I like as as Barbara Gordon. Um, yeah, I she just I don't I think she didn't even know why she got yanked or. If she does, she's not letting on. No, she, she's, right? She's handling it in a very professional manner. Isn't she, though? And that's really the, the point of, of mentioning it. Like, I'm impressed with her. And so I sent her, like, an instant message just to say, you know, you, you have to know that, that a large amount of people are just supporting the crap out of you for the crap, you know, what just happened to you. Yeah. You have our sympathy and support and uh, admiration, and, you know, so that we got to go back and forth a little bit on there. But then, yeah, then she said she, she liked the last podcast, so yay, Gail. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, un- I mean, that is cool. Like, well, it's unfortunate, though, that, uh, you know, they make, DC makes some really odd decisions. And, uh, you know, like, I, like, like you just said, it may be none of our business, maybe we'll never know why, um, and maybe we shouldn't know why, but that's just a weird, weird decision to make. I mean, she's that's one of the higher selling books. Yeah, I mean, why would you pull a, a winning horse mid-race like that? I don't know, you know, and, and that's, I think that's why people want to know, because it's so confusing. And right. And when, when people complain that um, there aren't enough you know, female superheroes or or whatever um, that have their own title, and then have one that is 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 an awesome book with good art, well written, uh, and and oh, and lot- written by a woman, so she understands how to write women. Exactly, and you like, wow, I don't know, I I don't know, like. It's still, it's like they want it to, to fail on purpose or something. Or I mean, or I don't know. Maybe uh, part of me thinks it's some pencil pusher that that goes, wait, we should be doing better than this. We can do better. You know what? Like, like I don't know. What kind of numbers did you expect? And it's everybody loves the book. Yeah. You know? The thing is, though, like I know there were um, a lot of Marvel. Uh, female lead books like I think the X-23 book and, and Spider-Woman and, and um, Alias and, and a whole bunch of the Marvel superhero women um, and, and probably even for DC too uh, you know aside from like Wonder Woman but they were selling decently like not not near the, even the top 10 or, but like in maybe in the top 50 or 100 or something like that right and they, even though the books were really well written and really cool, um, and, and, and the fans that did follow it religiously, um, loved it, they still got canceled and, and pulled just because they weren't doing the numbers that wish they were doing, I guess. But, yeah, I don't. Them, they were, she was, she was up there. I think that, I think it was in the top 20. I mean, I could be wrong about that, but. It was pretty high up and, and selling really well for a, uh, a female-centric superhero book. Exactly. It's just, well, it's just crazy. We could we could talk in circles about it for probably who knows how long. Well, Marjorie but, Lou was doing that X twenty three book, and yeah. and it was a strong book. It was it was cool too because she she didn't just do a female superhero she did the whole angst of being like a teenager and you know marvel canceled that book on her and you know i i don't know it, it there's something to be said about letting a woman writer write about a woman character I, they have better insight than guys would yeah absolutely you know i, I, mean? I think it's pretty 
Uh, I think it's pretty apparent that uh, for the years that the uh, comic books have been around, uh, with primarily men writing them, uh, and you just see, is that there's been very few really good characterizations of, uh, of women in those years, uh, right down to the, uh, the over-sexualization of, uh, costumes and, and, um, uh, the way that they act, I suppose. It was more, it was more, a, a fantasy of, of, what we hoped women would be if they were superheroes as opposed to how would they really feel were they to be and I, you know I think that a lot more of that has been done um, in the in the recent years anyway even by male writers um, everything was over uh, overly fantasized um, in, in like from the conception of obviously the super uh, Superman and stuff like that, like the ultimate person. Um, I mean, it still is. It's like obviously it's a, it's a fantasy genre, but like um, dealing with the, the inside as much as the the outside issues um, is interesting, and uh, we've. We're at a place now it, with comics that that it has a, a lot of both, or at least a, um, a good mixture of both, um, and, and I, that's what I like about it. And and you were just saying like you uh, you didn't like you don't like those shows like Mad Men and and The Sopranos. I never watched The Sopranos, but um, and maybe someday I'll get around to it. But Mad Men and Breaking Bad and Dexter and all that stuff. Like, these characters are, are 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 quote unquote bad guys. Right, flawed. But I, the, the, yeah, and that's that's the interesting part of it. Like those three shows um, are are three of my favorites: uh, Dexter, Mad Men, and Breaking Bad. And they are they are our modern day tragedies. Right. You know, and it, and and that's what it is. It's like. I don't I don't watch them because I want to be um, Walter White or or uh, Don Draper or um, sure Dexter Morgan um, but I watch them because I find it compelling and interesting to know um, you know the, the what what can make a person do that. And I think that, like, that's part of my, the, the whole thing about knowledge is power. When you know, you can, you don't have to go through something personally to learn from, from a situation. And it's that, I just find those things compelling. And um, you said the Thunderbolts were, was it? No, Secret Six. Secret but, Six. But Secret Six and Thunderbolts, same idea, pretty much. They're, they're groups of bad guys that are, you know on teams and doing whatever and it's like when you move away from the notion i mean comic books are always going to have good guys and bad guys but and, and so is life but not everybody can be a hundred percent one thing all the time like you could be one of the greatest people in the world but the human nature dictates that you're there are going to be moments of, of selfishness and ego and and all these other things that that will make you do something that maybe you're, you're not proud of sure. um and consequently you, you're not gonna be a guy walking around hunting kittens and and, and shooting people all the time not all the time, no. there has to be a, there has to be a moment where the red skull sits down and eats a pizza you know <laughs> imagine the delivery guy doing that one what's that imagine the delivery guy when he opens the door yeah <laughs> <laughs> so but i mean that's that's real and that's what i like about it is is these characters are so unreal but if there's that ounce of you know humanity that can be explored 
um, and, and explained, it, that is something I'd like to see, especially by uh, competent and, and um, talented writers, mm-hmm. uh, whether they be male or female. Um, and uh, I think that's why I like those those kind of things um because it's not just the surface idea of uh, of a serial killer or a meth dealer or you know right. a, a ruthless advertising man it's it is what's underneath and it's i mean maybe that's just like the actor in me that kind of wants to to study the human condition and and be prepared for anything but um <laughs> But uh, uh, well, yeah. it's funny too because I, I still want to see Dexter. I'm dying to see it. I don't, you know, watch me see it and I'll go, oh God, it's just like all the others that I can't stand. But, but the way the world has been telling me, you have to see this. It, it's it's so it's good, uh, and it, it's exactly what I just said. It's a it's it's a the uh, the window into that sort of idea because. You know, killing people is bad for any reason, but the show almost gets you to be like, well, you know, like it, it almost makes you want to make excuses for it. And then, and and you, in real life, you wouldn't, right? But the show is so compelling, and that's what I—I I mean, that that trick, that little trick of getting you to to. Be on the side of, of a serial killer, and I'm not going to spoil anything on you because you haven't seen any other yet. So, but it's interesting. I mean, uh, it's it's compelling, you know, and it's really good storytelling. And and that's, I mean, that's what it all what it really boils down to for me is if the story is good, because there's so much crap, and and it's funny, like we complain about the crap stories that we we get fed like twilight or some other you know comics that we don't think are as good or tv shows or whatever but i mean sure it's the nature of the idea that there is so much of it out there in our time period but you know (laughs) we we tend to to romanticize history as if william shakespeare was the only author or, or playwright back then or Charles Dickens or or any of the other you know fantastic writers there's a slew of other just crap out there from history that no one pays attention to because it was awful you know in another 50 years are we gonna are we you know not we because I don't know if I will be around by that time but uh, the people who are around they're gonna look back and they're gonna see the really great stuff and maybe hear about the bad stuff, but it's not going to matter. And then in another 50 years, the great, the really great stuff, the, the stuff that ends up sort of being timeless or even a commentary on our time, uh, like uh, a good social commentary on our time, will last, whereas the, the bad stuff will just be forgotten and buried. Hopefully, anyway. I mean, that's just how I feel about it, but... Well, bottom line, Gail, we support you. <laughs> right. Yeah, we do. Um, before you tell me about uh, The Hobbit, which I, I can't wait to hear about, I yeah. wanted to, one of the shows that I was promoting the one time, uh, Last Resort. Yes. Uh, apparently it's getting canceled. Oh, They're finishing bummer. up the season, uh, from what I read anyway. I, I hope it gets saved because I... That was not the one I thought would get yanked. I thought it would be um, Revolution, which actually has grown on me more than it did in the beginning. I, I still watch it. But Last Resort, man, I just caught the last two episodes. It's so good. It, it was a premise that I didn't think they'd be able to stretch this long, but man, it, it hurts. The uh, Someone I work with came in and told me about it and was actually almost in tears. She was so ticked. She's like, you son of a bee, you got me watching this show, I absolutely love it, and now they're yanking it. Now they're yeah. yanking it on us. <laughs> so, and it's, well, you know, I was shocked too, but shows have been saved in the past. Yeah, that's true. Um, may, hopefully it will. I, uh, I read an article on uh, Cracked of All Places, um, 
<laughs> like I don't talk about them enough. <laughs> uh, but they wrote an article dissecting revolution um, as being pretty much Star Wars. And I, now I've never seen Revolution, it's, but it's all right. The way that they deconstructed it, um, apparently, it is exactly Star Wars. With I mean, <clears throat> obviously, like minor modifications, obviously. maybe even major minor uh, modifications. But um, I'll send you the article, and you can uh, yeah, you can, I'll put like, you watch the show, so you you'll probably read it and be like. Oh man! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably mention it on a future episode. Yeah, I'll will send it to you and you can talk about it then. Okay. Um. So, so tell me about the Hobbit. Okay, the Hobbit is. Let me guess. It sucked. <laughs> yeah, it was the worst. <laughs> oh, no, just kidding. Um. Um. Right. So. I saw it in 48 frames per second, 3D. You can't see it in 48 without 3D, so whatever. Um, and I'm glad I did uh, for the experience of, of being able to, to experience that, the, taking it in that way. Um, and I'll definitely see it um, in the regular frame rate, 24 frames. Um, and I enjoyed it, but... Um, there are, There's a but? There is a but, um, and it has nothing to do with uh, the, the the acting or the way they put it together, the length, the idea that they cut this into three films, blah, blah, blah. Um, the only thing that I felt was odd was the was exactly that, the 48 frames, and, and it, not even the whole thing. About 75% of it, I thought, was really, really good. And then there was 25% where I looked at it and I was just like, that's not... Mm, that's something's not right. And I'll tell you exactly what it is. Okay. Uh, for the people listening, whether you've seen it or not, is not I'm not going to spoil anything. It's just... Uh, this is just a, a critique of the presentation of the film. Um, it, anytime... There was uh, an orange light in in the frame, or it was lit with an orange light, like a, like a torch or whatever. I guess they were all torches because, you know, or, or just if there was in a very sunny area and it happened to have an orange hue, it ended up or tended to look like, um, like a like a daytime soap opera, and and it was only for me in my personal experience, uh, experience of it, it was only in those orangey lit areas that it, it looked like that. Um, and there were also some certain scenes where um, there were a lot of really fast cuts um, and those tended to look not as good in the 48 frames. Um, and then also, <clears throat> there were a few, there was maybe a scene or two where the action was moving fast, and it seemed to be moving really fast, faster than it should have been moving, mm. um, which is odd because the 48 frames is supposed to, to pick up and display everything a lot more naturally. Mm. So what I think the issue is, and I don't, I, I don't, all the reviews I'm reading are just poo-pooing on the 48 frames, not really offering any sort of constructive criticism. They're just kind of saying, bad, don't do it anymore, blah, 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 whatever. Um, I don't think that that's true. There was a lot of that film that I thought looked and felt really, really good. What I think needs to happen, and hopefully Peter Jackson is smart enough, and he, I think he is, obviously. He's a really intelligent dude. Um... To, to understand the criticisms is that there needs to be um, if you're going to update the technology I think you need to update the way in which you film and the way in which you direct actors to to um, to, to, to uh, perform for this frame rate um, because it 
it is it's it's a different animal now and um as good as it could look if the performances are are in the old style it's not gonna translate as as well um into this 48 frames um and that was my that's like my only criticism of it when i see it in 24 i know i'm gonna love it no, nothing's gonna distract from the story um I know a million people have said it. I don't need to say it again, but I will. Martin Freeman is absolutely perfect as Bilbo Baggins. I got Ian McKellen is amazing as Gandalf. All the dwarves were were good. Um, the the other criticisms I've heard of it that I don't necessarily agree with are um, I read one in our local paper that was just atrocious. It's like they they didn't even uh, they didn't even know what they were talking about, and I just wanted to punch the newspaper. Um, but. Uh, they, there's there's some people who are concerned about the tone of the film, which is uh, not as as heavy or or serious as um, as the Lord of the Rings, uh, and that's just the nature of the actual story because the the story itself is a, generally a children's story. It just so happens that it's it's more written, um, I guess, in the way that that Disney described the way that he would tell the tales even though they were animation mm -hmm. they were movies for everybody they didn't talk down to children or try to dumb themselves down just for children but they weren't so adult that you couldn't you couldn't have the family sit and watch them and i think that's um for the most part how this movie feels um because the lord of the rings is a really heavy movie uh, i know there are kids that liked it and i was a kid when it came out essentially i mean it was a young teenager when it came out and i loved it but even if i was even younger i still probably would have loved it and uh, i'm not saying younger kids can't handle the themes or the the storytelling of those movies but just by its nature the hobbit is going to be less serious sure no less important to the overall story of the Lord of the Rings. Um, and for anybody who's never even seen the Lord of the Rings, like you, for example, I would highly suggest... I saw the first one. You saw the first movie? Saw oh, that's right. In the theater. Okay, well, you didn't see the whole thing. Nope. So, <laughs> that's that's okay, just to have seen that. But to, to fight the urge to watch the other two, I, I mean, you've already done it for so long. Come in on the ground floor of the hobbit this is my suggestion to anybody who who is interested but hasn't gotten around to seeing um coming on the ground floor with the hobbit because it's funny you you'll laugh uh there are great moments of of acting and of um just cinematic glory like they're uh there's just scene after scene that are fantastic and um the the Gollum scene with Martin Freeman and Andy Serkis's Gollum is amazing, and it's straight out of the book. I heard that. That was one of the things that did pop up where they're like, "Oh, the Gollum in this is fantastic." And he, he is. And and if you can, to the, to the audience as well as you, if you can fight the urge to to just watch Lord of the Rings just because you know whatever, yeah. and just watch these Hobbit movies. You know, we only have to wait a year and a half for them to be all done. It's going to be, it'll be December next year, and then in the summer is the, it's going to be the third movie. So um, watch all those through. Get this story out as as the groundwork, because um, it really is the lead-in to the Lord of the Rings. It's an explanation of you know a lot of stuff, and then watch those, and you will appreciate the whole. Yeah, I, I think I'd like that. Um, but. They were, yeah, it's just people unnecessarily complaining, and I, and it's really just people um, regurgitating what they've already heard from other people who don't know what they're talking about. Um, this, the decision to split it into three films may have been worrisome. I, I never was worried about it. I was excited about it from as soon as I heard that they might do it, and then they just said they were doing it, and I was like, great, fine. Um... It's only a 300-page book, but if you have read the book at all, 
um, there is, and you know anything about Tolkien, it's his his books are so dense. Even The Hobbit are, are so dense with information and stuff that um, he might ex- just say in in a sentence or 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 two or three that. If you were to put them in a cinematic experience and expand upon them with even without dialogue, just to show the stuff that he was able to to explain in a a very concise manner, um, eloquently as ever, um, it's it it will take a a portion of time. Um, And uh, I mean, 300 pages can go by fast or slow, depending on how you read it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's natural to just breeze through uh, a reading, but you have to understand when you when you read something, you're not you might not be reading dialogue as a person as people would perform it or or were it to be real, sure. people actually say it or do it. Um, so the performance is going to add time as well. But I ne- after seeing this first movie, I personally didn't feel like anything was was um, stretched for just to fill a movie. Sure. And people are saying that Peter Jackson just made stuff up and put it in there. Uh, no, he didn't. Everything that's in there is in some form of written Tolkien stuff whether it's the appendices or the actual hobbit it, it's in there the, I, okay the only thing that he did add I, i'm going to backtrack now is there's an opening prologue much like there was in the lord of the rings but again i i mean i never read the the silmarillion but i'm sure parts of that have to be in there like the the history it's like a history lesson essentially and the Silmarillion is essentially a history book, right? But it's a it's a a, a fictional history, um. So, I I don't understand people's complaints. Um, well, you know what we always say: people love that. to be negative. Right. Exactly. So, I think uh, overall, when all the movies are done, um, people are they're fears will be um it'll fade way but uh it was very very good um and like i said i i have to see it again in 24 frames a second because those scenes that did take me out i wished hadn't sure. um, and i and I, i'm gonna see it again with fresh eyes like i don't i don't mind seeing movies more than once um and i was really happy to see it in the way that i i saw it I just like I said, if there if that's going to end up being a a primary means of um, presenting a film, they need to work on their techniques of um, of filming it, and that's that's really it. Um, Excuse me. But again, you're thankful for it. So so good, and there I was not disappointed. Um, Good. Because I already like I already knew what I was getting into, you know. Right. I uh, I knew the story. I had just read it uh, about a month or two ago, and uh, I'm, pr- I'm I'm pretty sure I already said that on the show. But um, so I knew the story, and nothing caught me off guard really. There were mi- very very minor changes, um, and 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 I thought they made for good storytelling because. Um, one last thing, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm going on and on, uh, but I was watching the Colbert Report about two weeks ago. He had Hobbit Week, um, and he had Peter Jackson on one of the episodes, and Peter Jackson asked him, because uh, Colbert is a huge, huge Tolkien nerd. Oh, yes, 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 I heard about this. Go ahead. Uh, he, uh, Peter Jackson asked Colbert about the appendices, um, the parts that related to The Hobbit, and Colbert told him that the, the I guess, rumor, but it's more than a rumor, it's it's a little bit more fact, fact-based, was that 
all of the the stuff that ended up in the appendices of Return of the King that relates to the Hobbit was actually supposed to go into the Hobbit in a revised manner. The Tolkien was going to go back, um, and after having written, you know, Fellowship and uh, uh, Two Towers and finishing Return of the King, he said that these books relate, but um, they. Uh, I would I'd like them to be a lot more connected than than they they are and uh, the only thing he got away with was uh, he, he managed to revise the Gollum scene in the book to uh, to be m- more connected with uh, the way that it's told in Lord of the Rings uh, but not but his publishers wouldn't allow him to go back in and add all of the rest of the stuff that he wanted to relating to to what Gandalf does when he disappears here and there in the story and um, and also make it more of a mature toned book because I guess what the idea is is that in Tolkien's mind the way that he the, the gimmick of the Lord of the Rings is that it's it's um, it was a, a found um, text like like as if it is a history sure. of a world that existed and somebody had translated it they found the hobbit they found um as if bilbo baggins wrote the hobbit because that's essentially in the story what what it is bilbo is that is his retelling of his adventure and the lord of the rings is frodo gotcha those stories um and somebody found them and 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 translated them into the stories that they are. And he he was going to say, well, the Hobbit is a children's story, but it's only a children's story because that's the way it was translated. So let me go back and retranslate it and make it the way that it should be. And his publishers said, no way. So he only got to revise the Gollum part. Um, because it made sense to make it connect more. And then through the, his notes, essentially, um, into the end of The Return of the King and the appendices, which it explains what Gandalf was doing and, and what was going on around the time of The Hobbit and a little bit between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. So I feel like um, the, the whole point of me telling that story is in these movie versions of The Hobbit, you have to think of it not as a direct telling of the book. And if that's what you were expecting, then you were going to expect a movie that would be marginally less enjoyable. Right, right, right. Characters in the book, the, all the dwarves are almost retarded, for lack of a better word. They're... they're useless bumbling fools almost not all of them but a majority of them and not only that but they they're they're interchangeable they they do nothing i gotcha they're just dressing they're just a number that he decided on and 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 made rhyming names to be cutesy you know for his kids and stuff like that and they they almost serve no purpose other than they are you know, the driving force of, of why Bilbo's going on this adventure. All right. So these movies, when you think about what Tolkien wanted to do with the book um, and what he might have done had he been allowed, uh, this is the telling of what might have been. Okay. So this is the all, a little bit more mature version. It, it It's probably somewhere in between what exists and what could have existed and that's why i found enjoyment in it because it it, when i thought of it that way um yes there was a lot of stuff that was exactly the same as the book but it was just done in a way that wasn't going to be uh cutesy or or condescending to its audience right um but yet still didn't have the the gravitas of the the lord of the rings and it can't it just it, it you already i mean it's like the star wars prequels you know what's going to happen but 
for the most part, you know what's going to happen, at least to our two main, main important characters. Bilbo survives. He's obviously alive to write the book and be in Lord of the Rings, and so does Gandalf. Uh, the, the, the X Factors are all the dwarves, um, which if they follow the books, I know what happens, but who knows what they'll do. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's just I, I really enjoyed thinking of it that way, and I think if, if people go into it thinking of it that way, they'll, they'll find a lot more enjoyment. Um, and, uh, and right in the beginning that there's a, there's, it's in the trailer too. Bilbo says, um, my dear Frodo, I, I'm going to paraphrase, but he says something like, uh, I've, I've told you a lot of my story, but I haven't told you everything. And I, I think that was the nod from, um, Peter Jackson saying, yeah, you know, the story, but this is what could have been, and it's not me making it up. This is what Tolkien wrote. This is what was going to, this is what it could have been because he wanted it to be. Right. Or at least something similar, similar, an, an interpretation of it. And uh, for people who love Peter Jackson, like I do, his, his storytelling, the, the way that he crafts movies um, to, to turn around and be like, eh, not as good. It, well, you know, Trust the guy. Overall, it's going to end up being awesome, and uh, and I uh, I have faith in it. So that was my really long rant about the Hobbit, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I hope you guys, if you haven't seen it, will will take that into account, and maybe you'll understand and and, and feel good about the movie when you leave it. And uh, if if you've already seen it and weren't sure if you enjoyed it or didn't enjoy it, maybe if you hear me explain it in that way, maybe you could say, oh, okay, maybe. Maybe it wasn't as bad. Yeah. Um, it's not bad. It's not bad. I can't even understand why people would say that. It's it's a really really good movie. Um, remind me next time because <laughs> I know we got to wrap it up. Um, but remind me next time I want to mention about Hawaii Five O. Okay. Because that's that's a show that I watch and uh, I I realize what makes it different and you know. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just do it right now because it's really quick. Have you watched any of it? No. No, it's fun. Um, the, 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 what makes it fantastic and worth watching is the buddy dynamic between Dano and McGarrett. Uh, these are two guys who... McGarrett is like the over-the-top, you know, military guy, was a Navy SEAL. Uh, Dano was a Brooklyn cop. Okay. And he comes to Hawaii because his ex-wife moved there with his daughter, so now he's there. Well, now we're three seasons into it, and to watch these guys, and it started right from the beginning, but they took their time. These guys are brothers, you know? And right. They have the quiet, they, they take their time to give them the moment for the not mushy stuff, but you know, they, they let a conversation happen. They'll bicker like brothers, uh, but ultimately, you know, they'll hug, give each other a hug when they need it or whatever the deal is. Uh, and that's what keeps this show fantastic. Um, Plot-wise, you know, it's a typical cop show. Yeah. Uh, the pilot episode, the first couple episodes, the action was fantastic. Um, the downside is that, for whatever reason, they write McGarrett like he's out to prove that he can do anything. Okay. And he's constantly taking his shirt off. I, it's a joke Cindy and I have. We're like, all right, is it going to start off with him laying in bed with his shirt off, or is he going to have to jump in the water to save somebody and take his shirt off? <laughs> it's the writers who go, well, we have a female audience, and they like when he takes his shirt. You know, they're playing up to the audience too much. Yeah. And it's predictable. Um, but other, I mean, other than that, they've been smart enough to have McGarrett fall flat on his face because. They'll have him take down a guy unnecessarily. Okay. Uh, we get feedback. Uh, I don't. I don't hear any. No. All right. Um. So yeah, he'll take a guy down unnecessarily. And instead of just like sneaking up on him or shooting him, they'll have him climb to the top tower of a boat and rappel down. It's just stupid. <laughs> and so they've been nice enough to uh, have him fail a lot. Okay. And Dan kind of points that out, like you don't, you know, you're an idiot. <laughs> uh, 
So, yeah, that's that's what I would say about uh, Hawaii Five-0. I highly recommend it, uh, but it's it's the buddy dynamic that makes it worthwhile. Yeah. Um, but it's my turn. I get to pick the song. Yes, you do. And I've been dying so- to... There's certain people that I want to... You know, obviously all my favorites I want to touch on, and I don't want to repeat anybody until I hit certain people. Yeah. Uh, Katie Tunstall, I'm going to pick one of her songs. I adore her. I've said it before. She's like the perfect female singer-songwriter slash rocker. Yeah. Uh, she's not trying to... I know her heroes are the type of women who created that cliche image of a rocker chick or, you know, out to prove okay. herself in a man's world. Like Joan Jett or something? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but, but she isn't that way. She okay. just, she's real. She's natural. Uh, and coincidentally, she just happens to encompass all the the things that she, you know, all the things that her heroes worked at. Like, she just naturally is. Yeah. And she's diverse enough that she's not just doing the loud rockin' songs. Uh, she's not doing just the soft acoustic. She's doing harmony. She, Her last album, Tiger Suit, she could have lost me because uh, she did a quote-unquote dance album. Okay. Which sounds like it could be potentially disastrous, but it kept its guitar-driven root. So it's still a rocker. Yeah, but she she added the rhythm uh, that could be played in dance halls if she wanted it to. Yeah, um, I, there's good dance music. Yeah, and you know, for me, I just it's all just to me, and I can't stand that. Sometimes, sometimes. yeah. Well, and and again, here's a per case where it doesn't feel like it's that. Yeah. Um, she. Well, what's the difference between well-written music and? Exactly. Like, it's got a dance influence. Radio music. Yeah. Her stuff has got a dance influence, but it's still a rocker playing guitar to her songs. Right. Um, and anybody could go, please go out there and check out any videos from uh, Push That Not Away is one of them from Tiger Suit. Uh, that gives you a good I- idea. Then she has other on there, uh, Still a Weirdo. Uh, so she's she always has a wonderful mix. Yes. So now, my dilemma is if I want to, pick my first song to play of hers what direction do i go in oh and on top of that the reason i just love and adore her is she's sincerely just a wonderful sweet giving you know person that i'd love to have on this this show um if i can get a hold of her management i'll try and go through the proper channels but i'm sure she'd be all for it you know it, she's just that type of giving person yeah um Still have yet to see her live, though. She hasn't come to Philly in years, and I'm always on the lookout. Anyway, I digress. Okay, how do I pick a song? Um, I pick uh, Moment of Madness. Okay. It, it's it's a great rocker, but it, it doesn't feel like it's um, too, I don't know. It's nice. I think it, it's a nice middle ground of her stuff. Okay. And it's, yeah, so that's the song I pick. Uh, I hope everybody likes it. It was like a B side to one of her singles. But uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, well, we covered a lot, so <laughs> a lot, a lot. Yeah, well, well, and it's funny too because I'm still looking at my list of things I want to talk about, but we'll save them for next time. Yeah, so this is our Christmas episode. It's uh, it's stuffed with. Audio goodness of audio audio candy canes. <laughs> your by the way, uh, your audio got better once your computer restarted. Yeah, probably. I mean, because I I literally uh, just didn't. I mean, I didn't have anything else running. The only thing I pulled up was our our Skype. So yeah, it's probably a big factor. But. So for those who heard a little bit of echo through this episode, I'm trying to edit it as best as I can. Uh, we started and stopped, or stopped and started a couple times. Yeah. But now it seems to be good. Oh, well, good. So next time, for next time, I'll just restart my computer, and we'll, hopefully that'll that'll be good. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I hope everybody has or had a Merry Christmas, depending on when this goes up or when you hear it. In years from now, after this has first been posted, I hope all your Christmases after have been great, too. <laughs>
Yeah, unless you were uh, uh, a naughty person, and then I, I hope you have one bad Christmas, so it reminds you that. <laughs> good. But don't, don't be, don't be naughty. Oh, and it spirals out of control. <laughs> <laughs> all right well all right we'll, we'll wrap it up uh thanks for everybody who's who's listening please follow us on facebook um you could find me at twitter mac w jack i think it is yes and i'm uh at, i'm still be real nick narrow the real nick narrow uh b b real okay be real nick narrow be real yeah uh, and you know the YouTube page is Mac W Jack, where we're posting all these new ones. Yep. So, and I'm, I guess we'll try and put them on iTunes, maybe. Yeah, we'll see if we can. Um, we we'll give credit to Sarah for that one because she said she wished that it was on there. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we would have uh, a lot more people checking it out if it was, and um, if we can, if if it's a possibility, we will do it. So you'll be updated next time. All right, here's a moment of madness by Katie Tunstall. All right, everybody, have a uh, have a happy holiday. Bye. Adios.